Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series entitled C++ Models, conducted by CSIAC subject matter expert, Dr. James Fawcett. This series will explore different conceptual models underlying the C++ programming language. This particular podcast will discuss memory and class models. Well, in uh, this video, this is the th uh, third in a sequence of videos on C++, help, uh, C++ models. Uh, in this video, we will be discussing a memory model and C++ classes. <clears throat> so uh, the C++ memory model divides memory into static memory, stack memory, and heap memory. Uh, variables stored in static memory have the lifetime of the program. Uh, stack memory uh, is allocated any time uh, the thread of execution enters a scope. You call a function, you enter a for loop with curly braces. Anytime uh, you enter a region defined with curly braces, uh, stack memory is allocated, and um, the lifetime of that allocation exists from the time you enter the scope until you leave the, the thread of execution leaves that scope. Finally, heap memory is a uh, native heap in C++ um, and um, that uh, heap allocation starts when uh, you make a call to new and ends when uh, you make a call to delete on a variable that's stored. So how do you place uh, variables in these various memory locations? For static memory, you simply declare uh, the data item. Uh, you qualify the declaration with the keyword static. That places a variable in static memory, now has a lifetime of the program. Uh, to declare a variable in stack memory, anytime you're uh, in a scope, um, function scope, uh, perhaps, um, you simply declare the variable uh, that places it in the, uh, in the stack frame, uh, the stack memory allocated to that particular scope, and uh, the lifetime uh, for that variable lasts from the time you declared it until you reach the end of the scope, the thread of execution exits the scope. Uh, finally, you place a variable in heap memory by uh, calling new, specifying the type you want to create, and you may initialize it to give it a value. This is an unnamed type, but you have a pointer that called the new returns a pointer to that memory, and that uh, variable lives until um, the program calls delete on that pointer, and that uh, removes the uh, allocation. Okay, so let's uh, now turn to classes, C++ classes. <clears throat> Uh, a class typically manages data. I like to think of a class as a unit of data management. Uh, each class has a body of code uh, in static memory, and that code has a series of functions which access instances of data wherever they're stored. I'm showing you in this diagram on the, on the stack memory. That's typical. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, when I, the class basically acts like a cookie cutter when I declare a variable of that type, it just stamps out a region in memory uh, 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 with the data members for that type. And, you know, if I declare it again, it stamps out another variable. And it initializes always, the uh, language guarantees that these uh, allocations will be initialized so they're valid objects. Uh, so um, next question is when we call a function, for example, um, this is a point class and it has a name method. And so if we call p1.name with some string, in this case p1, that's mutating the state. And the question is how does this code find the object uh, to mutate? And the answer is that every call from a non-static member function passes its address to the code, uh, to the class code, 
uh, identified by the th this identifier, THIS, this identifier. And so this, uh, when, uh, P, when we call uh, p1.name, that sends p1's address, and then the class code uh, simply changes the uh, name in this class to whatever we supplied, in this case, p1. Okay, so, uh, you know, and that, and that same thing happens with p2 and p3, so uh, the, um, code uh, only has a single slot for the this pointer. So it's not really holding all three of these pointers at once. It only has a single slot. But every time we call a function, that slot is filled by the address of the object that uh, invoked the function, in this case, P1 invoking name. All right. So here's an example, a point class. So uh, it's a uh, Class is designed to model points in some space. So if this happened to be uh, space-time, uh, uh, we'd have a height, width, and depth variables and a time variable. So our coordinates would hold height, width, depth, and time. Um, but we might mm, perhaps be implementing a, uh, uh, designing a, uh, air quality monitor and air quality we might we might want to measure uh, temperature humidity carbon di dioxide carbon monoxide volatile organic compounds you know there might be 10 or 15 variables in that case there would be 10 or 15 coordinates in the space uh, when we declare a point locally in some function, the member data of that class is going to be stored in stack memory, just as we described in the previous memory model. Uh, now, uh, so here in this case, when we declare point, we're storing string, uh, a string name and a vector of doubles of vectors, just like an expandable array uh, on the stack, but that's not the whole story. The string class itself stores the character sequence for name on the native heap. And the vector stores its uh, collection of data in a contiguous uh, hunk of memory on the native heap. And, you know, we don't have to worry about that. The string manages uh, its allocation, vector manages its allocation. But um, these two guys. Uh, their storage occurs in two places. The control data is on the stack, here and here and here, and the um, user data, the characters for name and the uh, uh, values of double for the uh, um, coordinate values, uh, they reside on the native heap. And again, you know, our program doesn't have to manage that. That's all managed by the string and vector classes, instances of those classes. Um, <clears throat> so when we measure the size of that object, there's, a, uh, there's a, a size of operator. When we measure the size of this point object, we'll measure the size of name and vector, but all we're measuring is their size on the static, uh, you know, in their static allocation. We're not measuring what they hold on the heap. So for example, a string with 50 characters has the same size as a string with 300 characters because we're not measuring that character space on the, on the native heap. Uh, and um, you know, the reason it works that way is that the compiler needs that static, the size of that static control uh, stuff for string and for vector in order to lay out the code. When it's laying out the code up here in, uh, uh, for the point class, it needs to know that uh, static allocation. But the dynamic allocations, the character space for the name and the coordinate space for the uh, vector, um, they're uh, defined at runtime. Uh, the compiler has nothing to do with that. And so size of measures what the compiler needs to lay out its code. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit. You know, you don't need to worry terribly about all these details, but let's do a quick walkthrough with some of these. Uh, you'll notice here's a uh, function point, 
same name as a class, any function with the same name of the class is a constructor. That's what's used to initialize each one of these instances when we create them. This constructor uh, has a size n, which describes the number of coordinates, and a name which defaults to none, meaning we haven't defined a name yet. Uh, there's another interesting constructor point that takes a standard initializer list. This is a initializer list is a container from the standard library. And um, when we build a, co a constructor that accepts an initializer list, that allows us to initialize it with a braced set of values. So in this case, we'd have a braced set of coordinates, height, width, depth, and time, perhaps, okay? So, uh, and then we have a uh, name function that mutates uh, the state, and we have an overload of that name function um, that uh, takes nothing but returns the string name, and it's de uh, declared to be constant, it's qualified by this, uh, const, and that means that uh, we can call this name on a constant point. Uh, we can't call this name on a constant point because this will mutate, uh, and we're not allowed to do that with a constant object. Uh, we have a couple of index operators that, that allow us to index down through this vector of coordinates, you know, to pick a particular coordinate we want. Uh, this one returns a, a reference to a double, meaning that we can modify that. We can we can read it, but we can also write to that particular coordinate. Uh, so if we have um, operator two, we're gonna, uh, we have the potential of writing to the third coordinate. They count, starting count from zero, zero, one, two. So the um, third coordinate. Uh, but there's another index operator uh, that returns not a reference, but a value, a double by value, and is qualified as const. And the reason for that is that if I have a const point, uh, um, the compiler won't allow me to call this uh, operator, uh, this index operator that returns a reference because that can mutate the state. Won't let me do that on a constant object. If that's the only index operator I have, I can't index that constant object. Even if I only want to read it, the compiler isn't going to do that analysis. It just says, hey, I've only got an operator that can mutate. But if we provide this a const, this operator for const, then um, a uh, indexing of that const object will succeed, and the compiler would just use this const version, and so on. Uh, we have iterators that allow us, or acts uh, something like pointers that allow us to uh, index through the vector. And you know, if you uh, read through the C++ story from which these uh, uh, models were drawn, uh, you'll see that, uh, you'll uh, see lots of uses and explanations of the iterators. So that's an example of a point class, uh, uh, example of a class called point. Okay, so uh, we're going to stop here. Um, the next video, video, the fourth part four of this video sequence, We'll talk about object models. And this is probably the most important of the models. Um, you don't really understand how the language works and can't use it as effectively as you should unless you understand this object model. And we're going to do that next. So for now, uh, we'll say um, uh, we'll say goodbye and uh, thank you for your time uh, listening to this. A video, and I hope you'll join us for the next one. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you.